Well, over the years right here on Dream Car Garage, we've restored some of the greatest muscle cars and sports cars and race cars that have ever hit the pavement anywhere. Those cars included a 69 Baldwin Motion Camaro, a 65 Shelby GT350, a 70 Hemi Challenger, a 69 L88 Corvette Roadster, a full competition 427 Cobra driven by Bob Bonderon, a 70 Judge Convertible, a 70 Buick GS Convertible, a Hot Rod Prowler, an LS6 El Camino, a 68 KR Convertible Shelby, a 69 Corvette race car, the Good Mark Nova, and last year a 57 Big Break, Big Tank Fuelly Corvette race car. Well, this year here at Legendary Motor Car, we're gonna do something totally different. We're gonna restore a 57 300 Gullwing. The guys at BASF have always been car guys. They've owned some great cars, they've used it for promotion, and this car is no different. This car has been sitting in their warehouse for a few years, and now they want to do a ground up concourse restoration on a car they're going to take all through Europe and all through North America to promote their paint products. These guys are not only into paint, they're into really cool cars. BASF owns such a car because uh, paint people are, well, by chance, car people. We use it as a promotional tool to show some of the colors that we were producing both in the OEM business uh, and in our refinish repair business. Uh, if you look at it today, you'll see that it has what's called variochrome, which is an effect pigment. When you walk around the vehicle, it actually changes colors on you. It can be a silver on the left side of the vehicle and a green on the right. And in 08 is we're going to restore uh, this uh, Gull Wing back to its original condition, original paint, and we're going to put it on a tour as another promotional item for BSN. Because the hood, the trunk lid, and the doors are all aluminum, it's essential that we take special care when removing these parts. A little extra time now can save us a lot of time and grief later. Of course, all the trim in the grill needs to be replated. Well, when we're taking the body off, it's really good to have a couple extra hands and a lot of muscle. Sometimes it's easier to move it off by hand than using the hoist because you're trying to clear all the body mounts. Now we can actually see the substructure of the Mercedes and it's a real interesting piece of technology. Dry sump, you can see us removing the tank there, six cylinder slanted over on a slight angle for lower ground clearance. You can understand why this car was state of the art in 1957. With the engine out of the way, you can see basically a race car chassis and that's exactly what this car is. This is gonna be one interesting project. There are a few things in life that are sometimes just better if you do them by hand. One of those things is stripping an expensive car. You can use soda, you can use sand, you can use walnut shells, but fact of the matter is if you ruin one of these panels, you can't just phone up one of those repop panel companies and order one up you're in trouble. So what we did is we stripped the entire exterior skin. You've got just mild steel and you've got aluminum. And the process that a lot of these panels are actually put together with is they were spot welded. What they did is they actually spot welded two sheets of aluminum in this case together. So if you were to use baking soda and you got in between these two sheets, think of baking soda, it absorbs moisture. It's just gonna puff this apart and we're gonna have problems later. Well, sometimes with aluminum panels, you're just better off to do it by hand. That's exactly what we're doing. We're just going to use a DA. We're going to take off all the material. We're going to get it down to the aluminum. We have no fear of damaging it, warping it, or causing issues later. You can see how much paint material we removed here. If you look in the louvers here, you can see it'd be really hard to strip it with a machine or by hand. So the best thing here is to use baking soda and you don't want to warp these panels here. On the Mercedes, there were some air dams on the side fenders and some back scoops that you can't get into by hand. You can't get into it with any power tools. You don't want to use conventional sandblasting because the metal is thin and it will distort from sandblasting, so we use the soda. The soda will get into all the cracks and crevices. It'll take off the heavy paint, the body fill, tar cement. Also, we use the walnut shell and the corn cob uh, to do some samples in the wheel wells because they were heavily caked with tar. On the Mercedes, the bulk of the blasting was done with a black sand. We did all of the window openings, door jams, the basic floor. Anywhere where the steel is heavier gauge and is rusty and it removes all the corrosion and the paint. Well, bottom line is there's a half dozen different ways to strip a car. 
Each has the pros and cons, but there's one thing for sure is you better trust the guy that's holding the blasting nozzle because he can absolutely ruin a car if he doesn't know what he's doing. Probably the most interesting part of the Mercedes 300 SL Gullwing has got to be the space frame. The fact that they built a frame that was 50 kilograms, super light, yet super strong. And the way they achieved this was actually quite simple. Leave it to the Germans, simple and efficient. 25 mil tubes, one mil thick, super lightweight. But the fact that they triangulate it and had this deep area here across the sills, and every tube is either in compression or tension, and every tube is backed up by another tube the way a race car is built, and that's actually what they did. They stole this frame or the concept from the W194 sports race car. Well, after we got the frame back from the blasters here, we found a couple small items. The car's taken a light shot here in the left front. Once we've got our piece roughly cut out to match the piece that we're gonna replace, we can mark it. Then we're gonna use a cutoff wheel and precisely cut out the area so everything's gonna fit in nicely. We're gonna butt weld this piece in. You're gonna use a file to clean up the edges. Then you're gonna use a grinding disc to kind of chamfer it. The nicer we can make this step, the nicer the fit, the nicer the finish at the end. We're gonna use a magnet to hold it in place so it doesn't move around or walk around as we start to tack it in place. Remember the key to any sheet metal repair or any thin gauge is to tack it first. Don't saw it, weld it anywhere. You wanna distribute the heat. Once it's tacked in place, you can finish welding it. Because we're using a TIG machine here, it's not really not gonna take a whole bunch of grinding to clean it up and make the weld invisible. Once that's done, we wanna clean up the edges here using a Dremel tool, that way you're never gonna cut yourself. The second area of concern is back here in the battery box. You can see where the corrosiveness of the battery is eaten right through the tube. We're gonna have to replace the small tube section. First thing we're gonna do is cut out the damaged area. We can start with a rough cut and then we're gonna take a tube that's exactly the same dimensions, the same wall thickness and the same outside diameter. Once we've got the damaged area out of the way, we can use a grinding disc. We're gonna chamfer both the ends. Again, the better we can make this tube fit, the easier it is to weld. We're gonna clamp it in place and tack weld the one side first. We can still move it around if it's only tacked in place. Once we've got both sides firmly tacked in place, then we're ready to solid weld it. We're gonna weld this 360 degrees around even though most of it isn't seen. If you're gonna do it, you may as well do it right. Well, once the welding process is finished, we're ready to clean up the weld. You can use a grinding disc or you can use a file. Well, for a 50-year-old car, it's actually in really nice shape. At some point, the back of this car took a little love tap. We have to make a new panel for it. We'll go through that. The front of the car also kissed something, maybe in the same accident, but it wasn't as severe, so what we actually did is we took that panel off, repaired it, and put it back on. The first step we're gonna do is actually lay out a grid of fine line tape. We're gonna use this actually to make a template off of this. We're gonna use horizontal and vertical lines to make our grid. From that, we make our steel template. It's a one inch piece of sheet steel that actually gets shrunk to fit the contour of the rear valance. We're then gonna mark where our grid lies on that steel template. We're then gonna use cardboard and we're gonna use scissors to actually cut it so we can actually, instead of shrinking the cardboard, just lay it in place and we realize how small a piece and how much area of metal will later need to be shrunk or stretched. Our next step is to transfer that to the piece of metal. First, it must be clean of any oils so we're able to mark the piece of steel. Using our cardboard template, we're now able to transfer that onto the sheet steel. We use a straight edge, which is now oversized, and then a shear to cut the piece. Always make the panel slightly oversized, that way when it shrinks, it's not gonna be too small. Now using the grid lines that we had on the original valance, we're gonna transfer those to the sheet steel. Using two people on an English wheel is a lot easier to get started. Once you have a shape to it and is no longer floppy, it's easy to do it with one person.
Here you can see there's nowhere near enough crown yet for each area of the template. Go back to the English wheel and it's just a matter of time before we get the template to fit perfectly on our new rear valance. Once the rear valance is fitted to the car, it's time to tack it in place. Being careful here not to distort it. Once the top edge has been welded solid, we're ready to go down the sides. Using air to slowly cool the metal will reduce the chance of warpage. Having taped the panel in place, you can see not much grinding is required to make the weld virtually invisible. After that, sand it with a DA and we're ready for primer. Here you can see clearly the before and after. The panel fits perfectly and the repair is invisible. Well, a lot of people think that you should send out the plating at the end of the job. Really, it's a good idea to send it first thing. One, usually there's a backlog. It's hard to get good chrome platers. And secondly, if you get the plating back, you get a chance to fit it at this stage where you're fitting it to the existing bodywork. But let's take you through the steps. The plating process is an interesting one and a dirty one. When parts first come in, we photograph them and get them into our computer system for inventory control. And when the job uh, is approved and goes into production, the first step is the stripping room. The part is placed with copper hooks to carry the electricity on a copper rod and is hung in a vat of sulfuric acid, glycerin, copper sulfate, and a little bit of water, which runs at a very specific concentration to keep the base metal from, from dissolving. Electric is running down through those copper hooks and into the part, which is positively charged, and it deplates onto the negatively charged bus bar in the back of the tank. Although the electric stripping gets most of the plating off, in the sandblasting operation, we remove any oxidation or rust or, uh, or dead metal, oxidized metal that's left primarily in the backs of the parts, sometimes on the front of the parts as well. In the polishing department, we do the rough sanding on the parts before they get any plating put on them at all. We have to make sure that the parts are perfectly flat and level because once they get plated, they'll be very shiny and any defect in the surface of the metal will stand out. The muscle cars of the 1960s and 70s have a lot of stainless steel trim on them, which we repair here and, and take to a very high shine uh, instead of plating. We can plate stainless steel, but to go with the original car, we polish the stuff. We can weld it, repair it, repair broken pieces and tap out dents. In addition to that, we also plate plastic parts which you can see us copper buffing the plastic before it's plated with nickel and chrome. In the plating process, the first step is to clean the parts, make sure any grease, oils, or buffing compounds are off the part. We use an ultrasonic cleaning tank and then a hand scrub cleaning tank. After that, the soap is rinsed off the parts and the parts are wired up with an oil-free copper wire to copper hooks. Once the part is on the hook, we build them up with copper then we take them back to the polishing room and sand the copper down. Then we take them back to the plating room, build them up with copper, and we take them back to the polishing room and buff the copper out. Then they go back into the plating room again for the final nickel and chrome. Then the part can be placed into a nickel plating tank where it remains anywhere from 15 minutes to six hours, depending on the, the part. And then it, it is rinsed two times and inspect it again before it goes into the chrome plating tank where it stays for three to five minutes. After the chrome plating, there's two more rinses and then the part is off to the quality control room. Each part has the wires cut off of it and then is waxed with a clear polymer wax for inspection purposes as well as to protect the chrome layer. Every part is itemized in our computer system and if the part qu passes quality control, it's checked off in the computer system wrapped up in some foam and paper and placed in the box with the other parts to that job. We ship out of here with FedEx as well as two different freight companies to service our clients all over the world. We were excited when Dream Car Garage called and asked us to get on board with their Gullwing project because that's really our niche here. Every year we have cars that we've done the work on that go to Pebble Beach or Barrett Jackson. Most of the vehicles that we do chrome work for are not daily drivers. These cars are babied, trailered, and kept in garages.
Well, two of the real unique features, obviously, on a 300 SL, one are the gull wing doors, and secondly are these eyebrows, and both create a unique set of problems when you're doing a restoration. Once the eyebrows had been sandblasted and primed, we were ready to reattach them. The first step was actually to take a pencil and trace the outline of the eyebrow. That way we knew exactly where the eyebrow was going to end up on the car. After that, we quickly removed the eyebrow again and we were ready to clean off the edges. And you'll see later why we had to grind the corners of where the eyebrows are going to be attached. The next step was to lay out a piece of tape along that pencil line. We also carefully taped the edge of the eyebrow up. Using Norton Speed Grip, which is a modern adhesive used in many OE processes, we're able to now install the eyebrow using today's technology, as well as the regular original hardware, avoiding the chances of cracking. Using your finger and obviously some sort of protection, we're able to squeeze the Norton Speed Grip right into the crevice there, allowing for a cleaner finish. After we pull the tape away, you can see the results that we're looking for. Now the trick with these eyebrows is they tend to crack at the edges, so what we're doing is we're actually TIG welding the corners. That way if somebody tugs on an eyebrow, it's not going to crack the paint later. Well now that the eyebrows are reattached, we're ready to tackle the gull wing doors. The problem with the doors is there really isn't much in the way of adjustment here. But one of the first things we're going to do is put in all the weather strips and the new weather strips, the ones we're actually going to use. We're going to put in all the latches and catches and that way when we close it we know that's how we want the door to close. But if you look at the fit now you can see how tight it is on the front edge and you can see it's, it's about the right gap all the way in the rear. Using a measuring device, we can measure the exact gap at the rear of the door. We'll transfer that to the front edge of the door, and using it again as a scribe, we now have our mark in the primer. We'll then lay down some fine line tape. We'll use a pencil or a marker just in case the tape moves when we start the grinding process. We of course double check to make sure we're accurate using a grinding disc for the rough cut and then a metal file to finish it off and then a finer file to make sure it's perfect. Again, we'll go back to our measuring device to make sure the fit is uniform around the entire door. Well, one of the most interesting parts of this going has to be the brakes. The entire brake assembly is really unique. Think about it, aluminum backing plates, aluminum drums, two different materials on the brake shoes, and these copper lines, very interesting process. Everything is lightweight. Well, if you've, if you've watched this before, stainless steel brake lines are the best lines out there, and a lot of people don't understand. Stainless steel brake lines are a single tube. Then you have your regular double wall galvanized tubes, and then you have these copper lines. They're tough, they look great, they're fairly expensive, and that's why you don't see them anymore. And obviously, we can't just phone up Classic Tube and Paul Fix and say, hey guys, can you order us up a set? They've got to take the original pieces and bend them by hand, and that's an art in itself. Peter always gives me the uh, strange and interesting projects to work on, and this is one, a rare Mercedes. Now, through our normal process, we would put this on the CNC machine like you've seen on other Dream Car Garage episodes. But being such a uh, low production item, we would have to hand bend this. Now one of our craftsmen would actually take this tube and measure it to length and form it and then start to bend it. Using a simple piece of string to make sure that we've got all the bends accounted for, then lay it down on a measuring tape. We then program that into the computer and the slider comes along and allows us to cut it off at the correct length. The next step is to make sure we deburr the OD as well as the ID. After that, it's a matter of getting the correct end, sliding it over the tube, and then flaring it. This one being a double flare. Now the difficulty is that all of the bends were originally made by hand. There's no machines to make these. So manipulating the tube with a variety of different benders to make all the different radiuses. There's compound bends here. There's tight bends. There's large radius and small radius bends. These bends all have to be made by hand, and with 
the aid of tools, obviously, to make a perfect duplication. So this isn't necessarily a, a difficult thing to do, but it takes a real craftsman to have the coordination, the eye for accuracy. Uh, not everyone can do this and do it extremely well within the tolerances that, that you would like. Well, the engine's finally in the Gullwing project, and it's a pretty neat engine. It's a three liter, sloped over 45 degrees to the left. It's dry sump, Bosch fuel injected, not big compression, eight and a half to one mix, 215 horsepower, but obviously it was way ahead of its day with dry sump fuel injected. So we needed somebody to rebuild this engine that knows performance engines. Mike from Active Engines has done all our stuff for 20 years. He said, bring it on. Well, this was kind of a neat project. Uh, when we received the motor from Pete's place, we stripped the motor down and went through a cleaning process. At that point, we take the various component pieces and, and check them for defects. Once we determine the block's good, we check the pistons for size, check the uh, cylinder boards for taper with a dial gauge. We then put it in the honing machine and finished honed it so it would be ready for the new rings. With the connecting rods, we took the pistons off the rods, checked the pins, ordered new wrist pin bushings, uh, resized the big end of the rod, and put the piston and rod assembly back together again after we'd weighed them all out. Uh, with the crankshaft, the crank was, believe it or not, straight and on size, which is unbelievable for an older piece like this. Uh, we then uh, polished it, put it on the Heinz digital balancer and balanced the entire assembly. Uh, we had to order oversized guides, uh, which had to come from Germany. We heated the head up, we froze the guides, we installed them with a press, uh, then we had to size them. Once the guides were sized, then we had to cut the seats, lap in all the valves. At that point, we checked our spring heights and uh, used our RIMAC tester to ensure that the spring pressures were on spec. We then surfaced the head on our uh, resurfacer and uh, cleaned it and assembled the head. So when we got the engine over to assembly, the most difficult part about, about it was the fact that the the combustion chamber is actually part of the cylinder bore. We took two guys to get the pistons in the bore, one guy to compress the rings, and another guy to actually knock the piston into the bore. Other than that, we check all the running clearances twice, and everything went together well, and uh, we had a bit of a feat to time the camshaft, and that was because it was hard to get proper timing specs, but other than that, it went together well, and uh, we're hoping it worked good for you guys. After the body gets down, it better work. <laughs> They always do. BSF as well as Mercedes, of course, are well known. Typical German companies, uh, long standing history. Actually, Benz, when they started building the first automobiles in 71, we were already for five years in business as BSF. So we started in 1865. They built cars, and we actually started our business with making codecs. So the Glaserit brand actually was, uh, was uh, the first time in 1898 um, in the market. So you see uh, we have a lot of uh, joint history, we talk about innovations, we talk about quality and um, so we said this is something that actually brings us very close together. A cool car from these times and a Galwing, uh, again it's an icon, you know, believe, uh, imagine people 50 years ago thinking about building a car like this, all the new features, high class engine and at the same time putting uh, cool coatings on it, one of the best you can get. So we thought it's a perfect match. We are very close, uh, even from the locations. Also, headquarter of BSF is even closer to, to Stuttgart than Münster is, if you look at the map. And um, we're talking in the same language, uh, not only about the same language uh, if we talk about German or English, but it's really we, we share the same passion for the products. And uh, sometimes I, I say, you know, making coatings is like brewing uh, beer and we're good at it as well in Germany. You know, you have to have the right, the right ingredients, you have uh, to have long-lasting experience, and you have to have a passion for the final product. So um, that's, uh, they are very passionate about their cars, we are very passionate about our coatings, and uh, this also is a perfect fit. We call ourselves the chemical company, it's the largest chemical company, and of course, uh, you always have to be on, on the edge with technology. And one thing is clear and was clear already 30 years ago, that the new technology, if you paint, if you paint a car, for example, it has to be waterborne. So actually, we, I believe, and I'm sure we were the first in 72, 
we launched uh, waterborne materials here in the US already. And um, so today, in order to, to really be in compliance and to show that the latest technology is available, you have to, to be in everything you do uh, environmentally friendly. So this wire, we, are, we, we have the Glasrid R90 line, it's waterborne coatings, and this will be displayed on this car as well. So you really have old craftsmanship, ship, you have a cool car and you have the latest technology and it has to be waterborne. Uh, environmentally uh, perfect paint on this car and that's why we're going to paint it of course with the R90 line from Glasserit. Well so much of a restoration has to do with paint materials, priming materials, the colors underneath the car, the primers, the polyesters. BASF and Glasserit have always supplied us some materials and let's go through the process for this Gullwing. First off was the chassis. Well, we sandblasted the chassis. Then we had to put it into the black paint. Well, the original black paint was just sprayed over the raw metal. What we did is we primed it first, but we wanted to make sure if there was a stone chip, it wouldn't show through, so we couldn't use a green epoxy primer. BSF makes a black epoxy primer, and then we use just an acrylic enamel over top, and then we used a little bit of a flattening agent to get the right sort of sheen on the frame itself. If you also look at the, the floor pans and the tub in that car, it looks like a brown paint. Well, we color matched it when we took the car apart. What it was, there was lots of leftover materials after the war, and they were the browns and the greens that would have been on the tanks. It was slop paint. Mercedes wasn't going to throw that out. They were just going to use it in an area that probably wasn't real prevalent. So the next step was the body on this. Anytime we get the body back from the blasters, Right away, we clean it, we put it into epoxy primer. It actually bites and bonds into the metal. It's the best thing to do on any bare metal. Then we're going to do all the body work over top of that epoxy primer. Well, once the body work's done, you're going to see along some of the edges here, you're going to break through and get back down to the bare metal. So what we're going to do is we're going to put on one more coat of epoxy primer just to make sure that all the bare metal is protected, and then we're going to go into a polyester. Well, the polyester is what we use to straighten it. We're going to assemble the car again, and then what we're going to do is go through all the different grits of sandpaper, and we're going to make that car perfectly straight. That's the whole idea behind polyester. It builds up higher. 90% of it's going to end up on the ground, but the little high and low spots are going to be taken care of. Once that's all done, we're ready for the final primer. We're going to sand all that, and then finally, we're ready for paint. Well, unlike a Shelby or Mustang, you're not just going to order up the seat covers for one of these cars. A Mercedes SL in particular, you're going to have to start with a set of hides, you're going to have to cut them, you're going to have to do the patterns, and you better have somebody with a little bit of talent behind a sewing machine. Well, really, the seats are only a small part of the interior, but unfortunately, until the body is down and painted, we can't ship the entire car off to Garriott Diamond. That's when the rest of the interior will be installed. Well, one of the other features that's kind of interesting with the Gullwing is the fitted luggage. It was an option back in 57, and we're going to have a brand new set made for us. Well, uh, when the Gullwing uh, was created, uh, there was no luggage space other than behind the front seat, uh, behind the only seat, uh, because the, the trunk is uh, occupied by a spare tire. So it had to have fitted luggage to fit the car. So it was made in this unique shape uh, to fit that area behind the seat. And many of the other cars have the same problem. They just didn't have space for luggage. And so uh, custom uh, luggage manufacturers were called upon to, to create luggage to fit the cars. And the uh, leather luggage, it was a premium uh, purchase for the, the people that bought the cars. The linings are all plaid because the original uh, material was plaid. I, what I do is I uh, harmonize the plaid material to the leather color, uh, so it just or uh, or the car color if that's a preference. Mostly uh, the the construction of the of the Gullwing set and, and all the luggage basically is uh, it's mahogany plywood for the thin thin parts, the thin uh, wood, and then the rest of it is made with just basically 3 8 shop plywood. And then it's all gusseted at the corners for strength and, and glued and stapled together. If you'd like to uh, see some of the samples and the pr production uh, pictures, uh, I'll have that all on the Dream Car Garage site uh, for, for viewing. And uh, it's, uh, it, then there's a lot of luggage uh, that I've made over the years, some very unique things, and, and it's all uh, available on the site. 
Well, Jeff's working on final prep on the Mercedes Gullwing, and we had a little bit of dilemma with this car. We had to decide, are we gonna paint the body off the car, or are we gonna put it back on the chassis? Here's the upside, here's the downside. The upside of painting it off, it's a little bit neater, you don't have to worry about overspray. The downside with this car though is, as you bolt it down, is it gonna twist a little bit? Are the gaps gonna change slightly? And are you gonna damage or crack it as you're kind of putting the body down? We opted for the safe way, and we decided we're gonna bolt the body down first, we're gonna make sure all the gaps, we're happy with them, and then we're gonna do a final prep, and we're gonna do a super tape job, that way we won't get any overspray on the chassis. Well, of course, when you're prepping the car, 400, 600, anytime you're doing a metallic car, you gotta go to at least 600 wet on the car. That's exactly what Jeff's doing right now. Well, when it came down to color, we left that up to BASF. The manufacturers really decide what colors the auto manufacturers are gonna end up using. The decision comes up which trends will be there and which colors will be chosen. It's, of course, at the end, the auto manufacturer who makes the decision. And we as PSF are the ones who give the inspiration, who show them our latest color collections, who inform them about the latest pigment trends so they can make the best choice. Well, while we're at BASF in Germany, they actually taught us something. The color, if you just spray it on a spray out card, is not going to really represent what it's going to look like on the car. When uh, we show the colors to the customers, when it, it's about to display something, it's the small panels, it's for the first developments and the customer to choose if the direction is right. And the further we come in the progress and in the, in the project, um, we spray bigger and bigger panels or shapes speed shapes, stones, because um, you need sometimes the size and the forms to really judge the color right. Sometimes it's very important to look back in history to make really a forecast, because um, it's very interesting to see which kind of factors have to come together that, that is, at the end a certain color collection is more or less the collection of the decade. And uh, there are a lot of different factors, like I told you, it could be fashion, it could be architecture, but it could be also politics. If you look back and kind of analyze these factors, you can much easier see what the future will bring, which factors were important maybe in the 70s to make a color important, and to see, okay, where are we living now, what kind of themes are important at the moment. Well, once the car is all masked up, the last thing is to blow it off and tack rag it. That's to make sure there's no fine lint left on the car. Keep in mind, 90% of the dust that ends up in a paint job is either from the car itself or from the painter. Well, when it comes to mixing 90 line, you use an E3 reducer, which is actually an adjusting base. The ratio they recommend is two to one. The 90 line is a little different than the normal solvent based paste because this viscosity is very, very important. So you use a SATA viscosity tester and basically you put about four ounces in the cup and it drains through the bottom hole. It should take 18 to 21 seconds. If it takes a little longer than that, you know that the paint is a little bit too thick, you're gonna add a little more E3 reducer. Once that's all done, you're gonna make sure the viscosity is right, you're gonna pour it into the final cup, and you're gonna always use a filter. Anytime you're transferring paint from one container to another, use a filter. When it comes to spraying the 90 line, it's relatively simple. Your first coat is gonna be a light coat. Your second coat is gonna be a fairly heavy coat. Then you're gonna go around with your trouble light, you're gonna bend over and make sure you've got paint everywhere. This is really the, the coat that makes sure that coverage is correct. The last coat is called a drop coat. And what you wanna do is kind of dust the paint over the entire car so the metallics sit on top and you get that nice reflection. After that, you're ready to clear coat. Again, because we're gonna sand and polish this car, we're gonna use five coats of clear instead of three. That way we can cut down, down to 800 wet and make sure the car is perfectly straight. As far as drying times for the 90 line paint, they recommend you either use a quad system or this air blower system, which helps circulate the air over the panels and accelerate drying time. As far as cleanup goes with the 90 line, it's quite simple. Savtech has a gun washer where the water solvent just takes all the material out of the gun, it gets filtered through, and then the water just keeps recirculating. Every aspect of this water-based paint is good for the environment. 
One of the big problems in trying to do a gull wing restoration in a six month period is you have to have all hands on deck and you have to be working in two different locations. We've got Jeff polishing the remaining panels and of course we had the body drop down on the car. Well the beauty of the assembly is really a lot of it takes place before the body's ever down. Obviously the entire drivetrain will go in before the body is put down. All of the suspension, all of the brake lines, all of the fuel lines, the gas tank itself is already installed. Once the body is down, it's time to start with the wiring harness. With a brand new wiring harness to be installed, the best idea is to lay out the entire harness either on the floor or on the table and make sure it's complete. Having a complete set of schematics is also helpful and probably save you a ton of guesswork and time later. Generally what we do is when we take a wiring harness out of the car, it's a good idea to label all of the ends. Simply use some masking tape and a magic marker and just make a note of where that tab came from. Whether it came from the back of the amp gauge or it came from the back of the oil pressure gauge, it's important to make sure that one, the new harness fits properly and second, the ends are identical to the originals. All of the gauges in the dash were completely restored and refinished and obviously tested so we know the gauges will work properly. The bumpers come in multiple pieces and obviously in order to plate them, those bumpers need to be taken apart. The front bumper is actually five pieces. Well after we got the pieces back from the platers, it was time for reassembly. The trick here is to make sure that nothing gets over tightened, to make sure everything is kind of loose and fitted properly before it's snugged down. If you notice here, we're always using hand tools when working with the chrome plating and the trim. It's not the time to try and save time by using an impact gun or an electric piece. Those can only damage the chrome and will actually dish the chrome if you're not careful. Here's an old bumper and you can see how the chrome has been dished and that's from the bracket being snugged down with an impact gun or an electric impact and it can do nothing but damage. Well now we're down to the nitty gritty. We're down to Really, we only have about a couple weeks to finish this car, so we've got Jeff polishing this, we've got the interior getting finished off, and we've got the trim going on the car all at once. When the Mercedes engineers first bored a race car chassis, fitted fuel injection and a dry sump to a street engine, added one cool feature after another, even Mercedes could never have envisioned how iconic the 300 Gullwing would become. When we first started the Gullwing restoration, more than one person told us we couldn't finish a 300 SL in eight months. We were told this isn't your average muscle car. It's not even like restoring an early Ferrari or Cobra. Over 2,500 hours were crammed into eight short months. Hours upon hours trying to source some obtainium parts. And the price of those parts would even make a nouveau riche Russian billionaire choke. The guys back at a shop did a spectacular job. If you want to see this Gullwing, it'll be on display at the Meadowbrook Concourse as well as the Woodward Dream Cruise. And then this Mercedes will literally be on tour around the world with BASF.